For example, let's look at Darwin and evolution. My 14-year-old daughter, I came home the other day really excited and, and said, Daddy, Daddy, we learned about the scientific method and we learned all about Darwin and evolution and how he learned about evolution from the beaks of the finches and book. And so here's her textbook. Darwin found evidence from a wide range of sources to support his argument for evolution. And the only problem with that is that it's completely wrong. None of that happened. Good evening, everyone. My name is Yvonne Hunter. I'm the head of programming here at the Appel Salon at the Toronto Public Library. Tonight, we are talking about the big picture, the really big picture, in partnership with York University's Faculty of Science, whom I congratulate on celebrating their 50th anniversary. We are presenting dispatches from the frontiers of science, five big questions for the next 50 years. Our special guest is New York Times best-selling author Leonard Mladenov, who has co-authored, I think, two books with Stephen Hawking. <laughs> Eight books in total. Uh, Publishers Weekly says about his new book, The Upright Thinkers, that he breathes new life into science history. Tonight, Leonard responds to the question, how did we move so rapidly from caves to cars, from the savanna to skyscrapers, from walking on two legs to bounding on the moon. And the next question, or rather five questions for this evening, is where are we headed next? Our host for the evening is Anna Maria Tremonti, head of CBC's The Current, a familiar voice to all Canadians. She's been the host of Radio One's The Current since it first burst onto the airwaves in November of 2002, tackling everything from politics to the changes that affect our society, to the stories of individuals whose personal journeys and traumas affect us all. Her curiosity and insight bring, bring clarity to the big picture every day. Anna Maria has won two Gemini Awards and a Lifetime Achievement Award from Women in Film and Television in Toronto. Before I bring Anna Maria to the stage, I would like to wel welcome Dr. Ray, Ray Jayawardana, who will bring opening remarks on behalf of York University. And now I would like to introduce Dr. Ray Jayawardana on behalf of York University. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to welcome you this evening um, on behalf of the Faculty of Science at York University, where I happen to be the dean. We're very delighted to partner with the Toronto Public Library to bring you this exciting and wonderful event as part of a year-long celebration of our 50th anniversary. Let me take this opportunity to thank Yvonne Hunter and her team for producing this event with us, and also express our sincere gratitude to Anna Maria Tremonti for moderating tonight's proceedings. It is a time of growth and transformation for science at York as we build on a proud legacy of half a century. Uh, I hope you'll find other ways to engage with us in the weeks and months ahead. Uh, with, through events, public events like this, through the weekly open houses we have at the York Observatory every single week, through uh, summer science camps that we have for kids from grades 3 through 12. Um, you can cop pick up a copy of our 50th anniversary publication and other materials uh, in the back at the desk over there uh, on your way out if you haven't already. As I'm sure you know, science is at the heart of many of the biggest issues that we grapple today as a society from energy and the environment to health and security. Science has the power to transform our lives, not only by enabling technology and medicine, but also by teaching us critical thinking and enriching our lives culturally. Science underpins a multitude of other disciplines. Frankly, science provides context and perspective for our lives by revealing new ways of looking at the world and at ourselves. In my own field of astrophysics, we've gone from one solar system we knew of 20 years ago to thousands of extrasolar planets circling other stars. That's quite a dramatic step in two decades towards understanding our own place in the cosmic context. It's both ex exciting and always inspiring to imagine what the next five decades will bring. This evening, as uh, Yvonne mentioned, we will first hear about the story of science 
so far from Leonard Mladinov, uh, whose book, the latest book, just came out yesterday. So he's fresh off the press himself. Uh, and then you will hear from five of my York Science colleagues in rapid fire form about their exciting work on the frontiers of science and what discoveries may unfold in the coming decades. I'm very much looking forward to a fascinating and enjoyable discussion, and I'm sure you are too. Thank you for joining us. And now let me introduce our host for this evening. Please welcome Anna Maria Tremonte. Good evening, what a great crowd. Um, that's really encouraging because we have lots to talk about tonight and uh, lots to think about the wonder and the work of science and scientists. I expect you will be inspired today and I expect as well that you will have questions and you will go away thinking about the bigger questions of what um, all of our guests have to talk about tonight. Um, just a, a, a little reminder to think as we think about science, it was 50 years ago that the faculty of science science began at York University. So they had five faculty members in one building. Now they have 140 faculty members in five buildings. You can see them spreading out, little empire building there. Um, and uh, at the very beginning, they had laser technology pioneers, space science pioneers. So York University and its science faculty have been working toward the future for a very long time. Tonight, um, there are a couple of questions that our, our speakers will, will actually go into detail on as we look at where we're headed next. And I'll give you the questions now. Is our universe the only one? Will climate change put fish in hot water? How do we prevent a zombie plague? Will, will biometrics eliminate privacy altogether? Should we trust the machines? So, you will hear more about the work that these scientists are doing as they try to answer those questions for you tonight or actually perhaps give you more questions to think about as you leave here tonight. Um, and before we hear from them, we will hear from Leonard Molodinov. Now, you just heard that he has uh, many books, eight books in 30 languages. He received his PhD in theoretical physics from the University of California at Berkeley. He was a Humboldt Fellow, uh, and uh, he taught at the California Institute of Technology. He's a popular international speaker. He's the author of numerous academic papers in physics and popular science books. His last four science books have been bestsellers. Uh, he has written with Stephen Hawking, and Stephen Hawking says he never fails to make science both accessible and entertaining. So high praise indeed. And uh, another uh, quote for Leonard is that he thinks in equations but explains in anecdote, simile, and occasional bursts of neon. So we'll be looking for the neon tonight. Um, and with, with nothing further to say, I want you to come on up, Leonard, and let's begin. Welcome. <laughs> Hi, uh, I had a helium neon laser with me, but they took it at customs, so I'm sorry. I will have to do without the neon. Well, hey, thank you everyone for coming, and I can't wait to hear the next discussion, so I'll try and get through this. Plus, the hook's going to come after about 15 minutes and pull me off. So I want to talk a little bit about the human journey from living in trees to understanding the cosmos. You can't really do that in 15 minutes, so I'm going to give you a taste of the human journey from living in trees to understanding the cosmos. Let's start with a chronology. How do we get from living in the wild to modern science, briefly? Well, there have been many species of human. We're homo sapiens, and the term homo is the, our genus, which is a group of species. And we're just one of that group, and every other member of that group of species has become extinct, except for us. How did we get here? Why did we survive? Well, scientists today think that uh, the main reason that we were able to survive is our social skills. Now that living in modern society, or if you have a teenage daughter like me, you may think, social skills? <laughs> but um, living in the wild, that's really what helped us because we're not really physically very able. Chimpanzees are much stronger. Other animals are much faster. They have better teeth. They're more ferocious. But human beings learn to cooperate on a very complex level. If you look at somebody, you can tell what they're thinking. You can tell what they think you're thinking. You can tell what they think you think they're thinking. 
And actually, uh, psychologists go on, and the, the six degrees of this is what humans can handle. And that expansion of our brain helped us get along well enough to survive, but it also eventually started us thinking about deeper questions. And so around 10,000 BC, at the time that uh, people call the Neolithic Revolution or the Agricultural Revolution, humans started to settle down, and they started domesticating animals and plants. And if you study this in, in most schools today, they'll tell you that that's because it's more efficient and made life easier, but that's actually totally wrong. Uh, it made life harder, and when we examine fossils and other evidence from back then, we can see that the nomads who wandered had it easier, and the people who settled down had it much harder. So why did they settle down? Well, that time happens to coincide with the development of the first churches and places of worship, and also with the time when people started using their new brains that, have, that were recently expanded to think about the end of life and big questions about where we came from, why we're here, where did the, what is the universe, where did it come from, and they started worrying about what happens after death and what happens to their relatives. And so they started, uh, nomads, when they travel, people got older, sick, they would just leave them behind, and that was totally accepted and understood. And they, were just, they would just die in the wild like any animal. But around this time, people started burying their dead, and they would keep them with them. They literally under the floorboard. So they would have settlements, and they, they would bury their uh, relatives right with them where they lived. And these settlements would grow. They grew into thousands of, uh, of people. We don't call them cities because they didn't, there was no real reason for them to be together other than this bond and this wanting to be there with, with the past. A city is a, is, a, is a settlement where people specialize in labor and, then, and, and they cooperate in that way. So we have bakers and brewers and people who make clothes and that started around 3000 BC. So for thousands of years people were living together mainly just to be together. When cities came, people had to have ways of keeping records because now that different people did different things, you had to keep inventory, you had to, they, they collected taxes to keep the cities going, you had to know who owed who money. And so writing and arithmetic developed for that reason and we started having accountants and scribes. And a few hundred years later, that, all that knowledge traveled to Greece and we had the birth, what they call the birth, what people call the birth of reason, or the idea that we can apply reason to understand the world. So that was the next big step. And then there was hundreds more years, and we had what was called the scientific revolution. Now, the scientific revolution is also a lie. First of all, it's not a revolution. A revolution is something that happens suddenly, and it's, and it's undertaken by people with a common goal and a common end. And the scientific revolution was neither sudden nor was it undertaken by people who were united, nor did most of them even know what they were doing or why. But that was the next main era. And then came today, or the, or the era of the last century, where we learned to understand the world on a different level than ever before, on an abstract level, where we study nature, not what we see, what we feel, and what we can detect with our senses, but the nature that our instruments tell us about in a totally abstract way. So that's the chronology of science. And these are my parents. <laughs> the night, that's the night my father proposed to my mother. I, I wrote this book for my father. He went through the Holocaust and was in a concentration camp and in the underground before that. And he really saw the worst of humanity and the best. And when I started studying science, he told me that he thought science was part of the best of humanity and it's what makes us noble. And he was very interested in learning about science even though he had only a seventh grade education. And he didn't want to know about the technical parts of science. He wanted to know what science means for us and what it says about us that we do science and how humans do science. And so that's what I wrote the book about, and that's what I really think the history of science is about, and that's what you should study. So in my remaining handful of minutes, let's look at that a little bit. Not the chronology, but how is science really done? In school, you learn this scientific method. You ask a question, you have a hypothesis, you do an experiment, you see what that tells you, and you keep cycling until you get somewhere. For example, let's look at Darwin and evolution. My 14-year-old daughter with the social skills, or maybe not the social skills, uh, came home the other day really excited and, and said, Daddy, Daddy, we learned about the scientific method and we learned all about Darwin and evolution and how he learned about evolution from the beaks of the finches and blah, blah, blah. That was, uh, she was very excited to tell me the whole story. I said, oh, that's very interesting. I'd like to see it in your textbook. And so here's her textbook. 
Darwin found evidence from a wide range of sources to support his argument for evolution. So he had this hypothesis, it does seem that, and then he, and he did, couldn't do experiments, but that's okay because if you're an astronomer, for instance, you don't do experiments, you do observations. You can make observations, they can take the place of experiments. You can make a prediction and then look to see if it, if it holds. So that all makes sense. So he had his theory, he looked for evidence, he went to the Galapagos Islands on this ship, saw that the beaks of the finches varied according to the habitat. That supports his theory, lends evidence to his theory, helps him to carry his theory forward. Um, here's the BBC talking about it. While studying wildlife on the Galapagos, Darwin noticed the finches had variations, and that's the whole story. And it's very nicely tied together, very neat, simple, and that's the scientific method. And the only problem with that is that it's completely wrong. <laughs> None of that happened. So what's the real story, and how do scientists really do science? In my book, I talk about a lot of scientists' story. I have to pick one, and I've chosen Darwin to look into a little deeper. So he did start by asking a question. And actually, we're all, I like to say that we're all scientists because we all use scientific reasoning in our everyday lives, or we certainly have opportunities to, and it would help us to if we learned to do that. And Darwin did start by asking a question like the scientific method says. And his question was, what shall I do with my life? <laughs> he had tried medical school, and he, he was very queasy and hated the sight of blood. And that was a time where people did operations with blood flying everywhere and no anesthetic. That didn't seem to work for him. His father wanted him to be a clergyman, and he thought somehow that that wasn't, he was very religious, but he, I think he thought that would be a little bit boring. And so he was trying to find himself. Meanwhile, the captain of the Beagle was looking for what they call a naturalist, but really as a gentleman companion to keep him company. It was a non-paying job. You collected specimens. When I used to write in Hollywood, we would call that, you worked on spec. You would, go without pay, collect specimens, and try and make money later by selling them or shipping them home and getting money for them. So it was hard to find someone to do this, and Darwin fit the bill. He was from an um, upper-class family. He knew a little bit about nature, uh, but really what he liked was geology. And he said, sure, I'll do that. And what did he do? Well, when he went, this is what he said at the start of the cruise, geology and the invertebrate animals will be my chief object of pursuit through the whole voyage. Then he did, made the voyage. And what did he say at the end? Did he say, my God, I went there to study geology and the invertebrate animals, but I discovered evolution. Hallelujah, I'm going to be famous. I'm revolutionizing science. No, what he said was, during this cruise, I have done little except in geology. And in fact, that's the case. So where did evolution really come from? Well, he did send his uh, specimens back, and he started getting reports from different scientists who were examining them. For instance, they told him that those things that he thought, I think they thought they were mockingbirds, were really finches. And too bad you didn't tell what island they came from, we might learn something from them. But they did find some interesting results, and it got him thinking about evolution. And he developed this theory of evolution, not in a time of epiphany or on a few days on an island, but over decades. And just to show you what that took, this is just one product of his investigations into evolution. It's an 856-page um, book on barnacles. <laughs> So that's the kind of work it takes to do science, and we have people here who are doing that, and we'll talk about that later. It's not, oh, an apple falls, and I have an idea, or I see some finches, and I revolutionize things. And that's a really a destructive way of looking at science, because it, it belittles science. It makes it seem not just that it's easy, but it's not, that it's not very rich, not very complex. It couldn't, it couldn't really hold that much truth, because look how simple it is. Well, let me show you how simple this was. This is Darwin when he first started working on evolution. And this is Darwin when he finished. <laughs> so science takes its toll. Here's a few of the things he was up to. He studied animals in the London Zoo. He fed birds and studied their poop, because he was interested in knowing how far seeds could travel inside birds. That could they be transported to other islands, for instance, that way? Would they still be viable if they got pooped out? He examined the work of people who are artificially breeding uh, dogs, pigeons, horses. This is called artificial selection. And even though he was very queasy, he dissected hundreds of animals. So he overcame his queasiness, rolled up his sleeves, and, and, and took apart animals to look at their anatomy. And he also wrote a book on the emotions of apes and humans. And he compared the emotions of primates and humans. And he studied people from different countries as well. And that's a book that neuroscientists still talk about today. And of course, he did the barnacles, and he did a lot more. So he was a busy guy in those years. 
Five years on the voyage, he was a creationist all the time from the beginning till the end. He was a creationist when he started on evolution in 1837, the year after he got back. He was still a creationist. Five years later, all, he had, his, all, all the progress he had made working on evolution was 35 pages. Okay? As an author, I go, seven pages a year. That's slower than me. <laughs> now, he had to change his creationism a little bit because he, he, uh, creationists believe that species were put on Earth by God and are unchanging. And he saw that they were changing, but he had just a slightly modified version, as we often do in physics. We just modify our theory a little bit. And his theory was that God put these animals on Earth with a plan in a habitat, and the plan being that these animals that God put on Earth would then evolve as they're evolving. So it was still God's plan. What finally destroyed his faith in God wasn't his theory in evolution at all, even though it had been fading a little bit. But it was when his 10-year-old daughter, Annie, died of an intestinal, intestinal ailment in 1851. So Darwin's work was both of a, as a scientist and a person of faith, and, as a, and he was a human. So he was not just your textbook scientist who follows the, the facts. And he finally finished his theory in 1858, some 20 years after he started. So I'm just going to say briefly one, one quick comment about why these myths are, are dangerous. And uh, there's plenty of issues you can take. I just picked the issue of vaccines and autism. You could look at global warming or any other of the major issues that's out there. And the thing about the mythology of science that it makes it look simple, and people don't realize that when scientists um, write these papers, that they do a lot of work. This particular paper studied 498 cases of autism and did a lot of statistics on children who were not only autistic but who were healthy. And they did a, and they did a very intricate statistical analysis. Uh, th this work was quoted by more than 2,000 researchers who were doing their own work in the following 15 years. So when we get, come to these conclusions, just like Darwin, there's a lot that goes into it. Unfortunately, then you get statements like this. I've heard of many tragic cases of walking, talking, normal children who wound up with profound mental disorders after vaccines. This is like Rand Paul sees a kid who has a mental disorder, and he's like Newton the apple, and he has an epiphany. And it just doesn't work that way. By the way, there are um, a lot of tragic cases of kids who drank water and also later ended up with profound mental disorders. So perhaps we should avoid water, too. So how we really got from stone tools to trial and error exploration, um, and how, how did we really get from stone tools and trial and error exploration to modern science has to do with a, um, a lot of issues regarding the character and the real practice of science. First of all, that we have that the myths are not true. Most pioneer geniuses experience failure after failure, so scientists have to not only be willing to work hard, they have to be willing to be wrong. And every physicist, you don't have to take a course in it. You learn early to be able to, to admit that you're wrong and that you don't know something. And this is something that I think scientists can do better than people in the general public because most of your ideas are wrong. And even if you look at someone like Isaac Newton, Isaac Newton didn't get his ideas from a falling apple. He spent those, that plague year hitting his head against the wall and writing a lot of nonsense and some truth into something he called a waste book. And then he went away and did physics for a few more years. Then he had some other ideas like uh, that there are secrets to when the world will end that are hidden in the Bible in code and that the theory of gravity is also hidden in the Bible and in the writings of Plato and Pythagoras and he searched through all those writings looking for the theory of gravity. He spent many years, more than a decade, on alchemy and he eventually came back to his laws of motion and worked on them and figured it out. But he was wrong and failed time after time before he came to that. Another point is that scientists are often confused about their theories right up until the moment that they complete them. And they're confused about their theories even after they complete them. <laughs> so uh, there are many cases in history where the people don't understand their own theories. And for instance, quantum mechanics is a prime example. Everyone has heard that Einstein was against, quant against quantum mechanics. And I don't know if everyone knows this, but he was perhaps the most important figure in, in the invention of quantum mechanics. So Max Planck first found the quantum principle, and he didn't think it was a principle of nature at all. He just thought it was a cute trick, and it didn't have particular significance, but it did explain something called black body radiation. And then in the five years after he discovered that, no one wrote a single paper on it. Einstein then saw the significance of it. 
He wrote about it. Eight years later, when Max Planck was recommending him for the Nobel Prize, he said, Einstein's a great guy, but the one thing that he got wrong was that's quantum stuff. It uh, doesn't make any sense. And it took many more years until people accepted that. And when uh, two guys named Heisenberg, not the guy from Breaking Bad, <laughs> the, the original Heisenberg, and Schrodinger came up with a theory that convinced people that quantum theory was right, Einstein didn't buy it. Schrodinger didn't like Heisenberg's theory, and Heisenberg said Schrodinger was full of crap, literally. So this is how real science is done. <laughs> As I said, most ideas prove wrong. And finally, a good takeaway, which is a lot of these points are good not only for science but for life, such as don't be afraid to be wrong and don't be afraid of failure, but especially this one. Through science, through science history, curiosity, stubbornness, and what psychologists call grit, which is the ability to take a beating, have proven more important than insight. And that's true in, in many fields. So before I go, I just want to give you this, show you this one graph which shows that despite all this, science has had a great service to mankind, or I should say to humankind. For hundreds of years and for thousands of years before that, people lived between, on average, between 30 and 40 years. It was around 1800 when science started feeding into the Industrial Revolution and creating new machines and new tools for people to make their lives easier and better and to create new chemicals and new medicines that the lifespan started to um, grow, go on a, on a great uh, climb upward. And that's due to the, the, to the discoveries of all these hardworking individuals. So let me leave you with two quotes, one by Albert Einstein. The most beautiful and deepest experience a man can have is the sense of the mysterious. And an even better quote about the character of science from Tom Stoppard. It's the best possible time to be alive when almost everything you thought you knew is wrong. Thank you. I just have one question for you. Your father understood the humanity of science. Do you think we sometimes let that fall off the radar when we talk about science today? That we forget to, um, to appreciate that? Totally. <laughs> That's what the myths are all about, aren't they? They're, they're all about these lone geniuses who have these brilliant ideas and they don't talk about the, the human effort that goes into it, the human foibles that feed into their work, the feelings that they had. People tend to think of scientists as computers. Aren't, aren't scientists just walking computers? <laughs> People in lab coats. People in lab no coats. No lab coats here no. tonight. Okay, well, let's hear from our scientists who have a lot of humanity, and uh, I'm going to introduce um, uh, uh, each one or as we go and uh, just tell you who we are talking to, and I've got them all in the wrong order already, so bear with me. <laughs> We're going to start with Matthew Johnson. Matthew Johnson is jointly appointed to the Department of Physics and Astronomy at York University in Toronto and the Perimeter Institute in Waterloo. His research specialties are theoretical cosmology and high energy physics. He is known for his work on inflationary cosmology, the cosmology of string theory, and the first observable tests of eternal inflation. He did his postdoctoral research at Caltech and the Perimeter Institute. He earned his PhD at UC Santa Cruz. And his question tonight is, is our universe the only one? Matthew Johnson, welcome. Thank you very much. Right, so is our universe the only one? I have a hunch that the answer to this question might in fact be no. So here's what I think it might look like. Imagine a fog that permeates the universe and it causes it to undergo really drastic expansion. From this fog emerge bubbles and each of these bubbles contain regions that possibly have different laws of physics. Now this soup of bubbles just keeps on going. So this is eternal inflation, and I'll tell you what that is in a second. Uh, and the story is that inside one of these bubbles, you will find us sitting here today. You will find our universe. So you're probably going to stop and say, I thought the universe meant everything. So what do I mean, is our universe the only one? How can there be other universes? The universe is everything. So let me be a little bit more specific and mention what cosmologists usually refer to when they say 
the universe. They usually mean the observable universe, which you can define basically as everything that we see. So to give you an analogy for what that is, uh, let's take a look at this picture of a sunset. So the distant horizon in this picture is the edge of the observable part of the Earth. And uh, I took this picture sitting on a beach in Hawaii in December while you were all freezing your butts off here in Toronto. <laughs> Uh, so, so there are very different places on the Earth, and everyone in different places sees a different horizon. And that's what I mean by the multiverse. Uh, the multiverse is a collection of all the different observable universes, just like uh, the Earth is the collection of all of the sunsets and sunrises and blue skies and rainy days that exist on the Earth right now at this moment. In cosmology, there's a big difference, though. And that has to do with the fact that the speed of light is constant, which Einstein told us. Uh, and so what that implies is that far away, for us, equals back in time. So we see things today as they were in the past. For example, here's the sun as it was eight minutes ago, because it takes about eight minutes for light to travel from the sun to the Earth, into my eyes. And things get really drastic when we talk about the universe on the largest scale. So in this image from the Hubble Space Telescope, we see the universe as it was about 13.2 billion years ago. And if we go back just a bit further, we reach the edge. This is the horizon for our observable universe. It's something called the cosmic microwave background radiation. And let me tell you just a little bit about what that is. So you've all heard of the Big Bang Theory, and I do not mean the television show. Um, it's the idea that the universe started out very hot and dense, and then through expansion, it cooled. And here we are today. And that whole process, we think, took about 13.8 billion years. Uh, I'll brag a little bit. Actually, now we know that number to within about 1%, so I could have put the error bars on it. But here we are today, right? So the CMB is the process of the universe going from being opaque when it was very hot to transparent as it is today. We look out and we see all the galaxies and stars, so uh, light can travel a ways. And so the cosmic microwave background radiation is basically uh, like the cloud that fills the early universe. Okay, so, so this is light from very early on, about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. When I look at this picture, I wonder what lies beyond the horizon, besides you guys freezing your butts off here in Toronto. I might want to know how diverse the Earth is, you know, what, what kind of peoples inhabit it, uh, how big is it, how many places could I imagine going? And I wonder exactly the same questions when I look at this picture. I wonder what lies beyond the horizon for our observable universe. And we have an idea. Okay, that idea comes from a theory that, if you like, is the prequel to the observable universe, the thing that came before. And that's something we think uh, happened in the past called inflation. Inflation is dramatic expansion of the universe, uh, where you take some region about the size of an atomic, uh, of an atom, uh, and you blow it up to something roughly the size of a galaxy. And you do that all in 10 to the minus 36 seconds. Uh, which, you know, if I wrote all the zeros, they wouldn't fit on my slide. Um, it's a crazy idea, but actually, if we go back to this picture, it explains all the patterns of light you see in this picture amazingly well. Uh, so we think there's something to it. It's not just totally made up. Now, inflation tends to make universes that are a little bit bigger, or maybe a lot bigger, than the part that we see. There's no reason that it, it, it made just enough, okay? So inflation tends to make the universe far bigger than our observable universe. And by my definition, that means inflation makes a multiverse. Okay, so if this idea is right, then we inhabit a multiverse. There are other universes. And the story gets even more interesting when we ask about diversity. So it turns out that empty space is not at all empty. Uh, we now know it's full of something called the Higgs field. So ripples in the Higgs field are what was discovered at the Large Hadron Collider a few years ago, the Higgs boson. And in theoretical physics, we think that the Higgs field, or its close cousins, can come in many colors. They, they can have many properties. And these properties correspond to different laws of physics. 
So you might have heard that the Higgs boson is the particle that tells all the other particles what their mass should be. So for example, with a different color of the Higgs field, maybe uh, all the particles have different masses. And inflation, it turns out, can sample all the colors of the Higgs field. And so what you get is a universe that's very big, but also extraordinarily diverse. And you get different Higgs field colors in different pockets or different bubbles. Okay? So that's where that picture that I showed you in the beginning came from. That was a simulation of inflation making this great diversity we think might exist. And there's kind of a neat thing that happens, which is if we're lucky enough, the pocket we're in might run into another pocket. You can quantify how lucky you have to be. Um, and it turns out, you know, maybe we are lucky. And this is a signal you can go look for. So you can look for the wreckage of this collision that happened at some time in the past. So here's a picture of that cosmic microwave background radiation with all the patterns uh, as we see it, essentially. Uh, and here's what it would look like if it got smacked by a few bubbles. Okay. So there's a pattern. You see these disks in this image. Of course, this is extraordinarily exaggerated, and it's a simulation. Otherwise, I'd be giving the Nobel Prize speech right now, and I wouldn't be here in, in the library. Um, but nevertheless, we can go look for these things. So, uh, so by looking for these patterns, we can tell which types of multiverses could be allowed and which ones aren't. And this is real golden era in cosmology because we're flooded with data. So, uh, so this is the Planck satellite, which uh, unfortunately has outlived its useful lifetime. Um, but it's, it's delivered extraordinarily great data on the cosmic microwave background radiation. And so my research group looks for things like smacking into other universes in the data that's generated by this satellite. And uh, if you stay tuned, maybe someday we will be able to tell you whether or not we live in a multiverse, whether or not our universe is the only one. Thank you very much. Before you go, what captured your imagination? Why do you study this? I, when I was a graduate student, I thought I wanted to do experimental particle physics. I quickly learned that that means that you solder wires all night and sit in a control room all night, and that wasn't for me. And I wanted to figure out what theoretical physics was about. I happened to be very lucky and have a, a very good PhD advisor uh, who captured my imagination with cosmology. And uh, from then on, I was sold. That is a great answer. Our next guest is Sapna Sharma, who is an associate professor in the Department of Biology at York University. She received her PhD from the University of Toronto. She held postdoctoral fellowships at the University of Montreal and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Now, the primary focus of her research includes understanding the impact of environmental stressors such as climate change, invasive species introductions, habitat, degeneration on ecosystems at a range of spatial and temporal scales and improving our abilities to develop predictive models. And the question she is asking tonight, will northern fish populations be in hot water because of climate change? Thank you. Um, so we're currently experiencing our sixth mass extinction on Earth. And current extinction rates are approximately 1,000 times the natural background rate. Um, so that means approximately 200 to 20,000 species are going extinct every year. But as opposed to previous mass extinctions, this one's caused by a single species, humans. And the primary way that they're causing these extinctions is through climate change, habitat degradation, and introduction of invasive species. A recent study suggests that if climate warms by four degrees Celsius, one in six species could go extinct on Earth in the next 50 to 70 years. And so what I'm interested in looking at, and my research group is interested in looking at, is how climate change impacts biodiversity. So I'm gonna share two stories with you today. So first, illustrating how climate has already changed in the past, and then what the implications are for us locally in Ontario for our freshwater fish populations. 
So the first story I'm going to talk to you about is from Japan. And we now have access to the longest lake ice record ever collected by humans. And this wasn't collected for scientific reasons. It was because the Shinto shrine was on, on the lake. And the story was that on one side of the lake, a god and goddess lived in the shrine together. And sometimes what happens when people live together for too long, they got into a disagreement. And the goddess moved out. And so she moved out across the lake and built her own shrine. And every year when the lake freezes, the god crosses the lake with his dragon. And the sinusoidal shape that you see that's left on the ice by the ridge is from the dragon's tail. So he makes amends to the goddess every winter. And Shinto priests celebrated this event from, for the past 550 years. So since 1442, they've been recording the date at which this ridge was formed. And from there, we can now get an idea of how climate has changed before and after the Industrial Revolution. And so what I'm showing you here is the ice record and something so as simple as did the lake freeze or not in a particular year. And so um, you can see time on the x-axis and then on the y-axis the number of times the lake froze. So the key thing to note is that in the first 250 years of the record, the lake did not freeze three times. In the last 50 years, the lake does not freeze one out of every four years. So looking at something as simple as does a lake freeze collected by 15 generations of Shinto priests, we can see that climate is warming and warming at faster rates in the past 50 years. So is Lake Suwa in Japan unique? Well, through a collaboration, the Global Lake Temperature Collaboration, we're looking at how 350 lakes around the world are warming in the past 25 years. And so in this map, the red regions represent increasing uh, rates of warming of water temperatures, and blue regions represent cooler, um, cooler rates of warming. What we found is that 90% of lakes are warming around the world. And in fact, for us in Ontario and Canada, what we're also finding is that lakes that become ice covered in winter are warming twice as fast as air temperatures. So we're experiencing even more warming than other tropical regions um, or temperate regions around the world. So what does that mean for our fisheries in Ontario? And the story I'm gonna tell you specifically is some of our research looking at the invasion of smallmouth bass into Ontario lakes. So smallmouth bass is a warm water invasive fish species that's native to eastern USA. And it's been invading lakes in southern and central Ontario for the last 100 to 150 years at rates of about 25 kilometers per year. You might wonder, how does a fish move 25 kilometers per year? Well, in the last 100 uh, years, government scientists actually helped the fish move. So they would ride the railroads and throw bass into lakes as they passed them from the trains. For lakes that weren't accessible by road or railroad, they would fly over on planes and dump the fish into the lakes as, as they flew over them. Anglers have been spreading smallmouth bass around the world, around the world for uh, many years. And now that the climate is warm enough in Ontario, bass can start moving naturally northwards through the lakes. And so what our research lab is doing is predicting where smallmouth bass might be in the future. And so here is a map, and the red regions represent regions where smallmouth bass are likely to occur. And this is the current business as usual climate change scenario. So what that means is if we continue emitting greenhouse gases at current rates, smallmouth bass will saturate the landscape and be found across lakes across Ontario. This is a map of what the situation would be like if we stabilize greenhouse gas emissions in the next 15 to 20 years. So you can see the red regions are really restricted to southern Ontario in a pocket in northwestern Ontario, and most lakes across Ontario wouldn't have 
accessible habitat for smallmouth bass, which is a positive message um, that we can, we can take with us. So what's the problem with bass anyways? Well, when they're, they invade a lake, they're often associated with reduced biodiversity. So for example, by 2050, 25,000 minnow populations are predicted to be lost in Ontario because of the invasion. Smallmouth bass also outcompete native predators for prey. Uh, this includes walleye or pickerel that you might like to eat or fish for. Um, and it's an important constituent of the Great Lakes fishery that's worth $4.5 billion a year. Another fish that you may be familiar with is a lake trout. And lake trout is an iconic Canadian fish with only a handful of populations left outside of uh, Canada and North America. And so Americans come to Canada to fish for lake trout because of its um, its importance, and we're predicting the loss of over 5,000 lake trout populations in Ontario under scenarios of climate change. And so if we take a bigger perspective, what we find is that currently Ontario lakes support high biodiversity uh, filled with cool and cold water predators that you're familiar with and a unique Canadian fishery. And if we predict what might happen in the future, what we see is that we've lost all of these cool and cold water predators. We've lost all of the commercial inland fisheries, which means uh, a loss of uh, economic importance for the province. And the community is replaced by warm water invasives and smaller generalist fishes that you might see in Midwestern US. So what can we do about this? Well, the first thing uh, to deal with the loss of biodiversity because of invasive species is prevention. So all of us can make a conscious effort not to spread uh, aquatic or terrestrial invaders into our ecosystems. Secondly, uh, mitigating greenhouse gas emissions and stabilizing greenhouse gas emissions in the next 15 to 20 years could have um, good consequences and good implications for our biodiversity. So investing in alternative energy or different um, sources of energy is, is, a, is a good way to go. And before I end, I would just like to thank uh, the many students in my laboratory who've done a lot of hard work to put these models together, as well as my collaborators and funding sources. Thanks. You are talking really about the unintended consequences of, of different actions, right? From sport fishermen to what they're doing along the railway to climate change. It's, um, it's very interesting when you start to connect the dots. Yeah, that, that's sort of an important part of my research is looking at multiple stressors because the world is not just composed of a single problem. There's many problems impacting our biodiversity and so Looking at those in tandem gives us an idea of what might we might expect in the future. Thank you. Thank you. You will never think about a smallmouth bass in the same way. <laughs> Our next scientist is Damien Ifa. He earned his PhD in pharmacology at the University of Sao Paulo. After research positions at Purdue University in the US, he joined the chemistry department at York University as an assistant professor. His major research interests are ambient ionization techniques, imaging mass spectrometry, spect Trump, am I, I'm, I'm, I'm mangling that, sorry. Structural biology and clinical mass spectrometry. Will biometrics eliminate privacy altogether? Now there is a question that really fits in with the news of the day. Come on up, Damien. All right, so I'll talk about uh, biometrics and privacy. So biometrics refers to the measurement of a physical characteristics or a behavior trait that can be used <clears throat> to verify a person's identity. Examples of uh, biometrics include the iris, the face recognition, the hand geometry, the fingerprints, a signature, or even the voice can be used to identify a person, right? But uh, uh, biometrics identifiers, they cannot be lost or forgotten. 
and they are very difficult to copy, to forge, or share. And uh, they require the person to be present at the moment of the authentication. So they represent a very good alternative for the uh, increasing number of cards and tokens and passwords of different lengths and complexity that we're using right now. However, the Evolven technology uh, allows the collection of a far more information that the user may be aware of, right? So companies, uh, governments, they can use this data without the user permission, and that would raise some privacy concerns. So one of the biometric systems that uh, uh, we are all aware of, it's fingerprint analysis, right? The fingerprint analysis is based on three fundamental uh, aspects. The first one is the, the fingerprint, it's a unique uh, characteristic, right? So your fingerprint, it's only yours, nobody has a fingerprint like you. The second uh, characteristic is the fingerprint remain unchanged during your lifespan. So the fingerprint that you have when you had five years old is the same that you have now and will be the same for the rest of your life. And the third one is that the fingerprint had regions that can be uh, systematically classified, right? So for the classification of the fingerprints, we use three different levels. So the first level is just the, the shape of the regions. If you look at the fingertips, you're gonna see some people got loops, some people got arcs. The second level of identification are these small uh, features that are called minuti, right? So the ending of the ridge or bi bifurcations of the ridge, uh, the position of these features in the finger are very important for classification. The third level is even more, uh, have even more details. It uh, deals with the number of pores and the position of the pores on the, on the fingerprint, on, on, on the tip of the finger. So, and we, all are, and we are all using fingerprints today, right? So people can start a car using fingerprints. We can unlock computers or cell phones using the fingerprints. We can even get admitted in a country using the fingerprint identification system. But there is more information in a fingerprint that you may be aware of, and I will show you. So when we touch things, we transfer the material from our hands to the object that has been touched. Right? And it creates an almost invisible finger mark that we call latent fingerprint. The latent fingerprint has to be developed by dusting or special lights in order to be visualized, photographed, and collected for investigation. Right? But the new information is about the chemical composition of fingerprints. Right? Normally, a fingerprint is composed by natural endogenous compounds, such as fatty acids, amino acids, salts, or water. But we can also see exogenous compounds, such as dust, cosmetics, illicit drugs, and explosives. So if you're handling some material, you start to spread traces of these chemicals uh, around. So this is very important um, for forensic purpose. Note if you can link the person, the ID of the person with the fingerprint, with the presence of uh, illicit drugs and explosives, is a very strong, that's a very strong evidence that should be further investigated, right? So I work with analytical chemistry, and there are some different kinds of techniques that we can use to study in detail the composition of the chemical composition of the fingerprints. One of these techniques is uh, infrared spectroscopy, which is based on the absorption of the infrared light at the different uh, wavelengths. So it creates a signature spectrum that can be used uh, to search a uh, database to identify the compound. So for instance, here we have in red, we have a signature spectrum of a, a drug, in this case is acetaminophen, right, that is present on a fingerprint. So this technique is very uh, useful for drugs and explosives detection. Another technique, that's the technique that I work at uh, York University, it's called mass spectrometry. Imaging is based on the desorption and ionization of the molecules. So the molecules are ionized and are then analyzed by uh, equipment called mass spectrometer, right? It's a very uh, powerful technique for analysis of po uh, polymers, spermicides, gunpowder residues, drugs, explosives. But um, if you, you see here in this panel, we have a fingerprint, right? We're mapping the distribution of a one compound. It's called N9. So this compound is a spermicide. So in these experiments, the individual was handling, with, uh, uh, handling condoms, 
with uh, lubricants and spermicides in the formulation. And after handling the condoms, they start to touch the surface, and we could recreate the fingerprints on this, the, the, the surface using mass spec. So again, this is a very powerful technique. If you can link this person, this ID, with the presence of this specific kind of molecule, you create and you get a new evidence that should be further investigated, right? So I wish I had more time to expose to you all the, the future developments in, in analytical chemistry and how to do the fingerprint analysis, but now I wanna point to the privacy concerns of this technology. So we have the evolving technology, we have new uh, ways to uh, pinpoint and point out for this uh, drugs. So, but that will raise some privacy concerns. For instance, can we screen athletes by, for, for drugs? Can it just collect their fingerprints and see if they're drugs or using drugs or not? Can we screen the general public just using these fingerprints? So when you open a door, they, we can also see if you have some illicit drugs or explosives in your fingerprint. So said that, I would have finished, I finished my talk showing two statements. The first one is that the employer will know that you come late for work and has uh, illicit drugs in the fingerprints. That would be a privacy and uh, concern. And the other one is this, this is Sting. Sting was a rock star from the 80s. And they have a song that says that every breath you take, every move you make, I'll be watching you. Thank you. Is it only illicit drugs they could, they could? <laughs> Well, yeah, maybe if somebody's because if somebody wants to know something about you, maybe you're on a medication. It's none of anybody's business. If somebody wanted, yes. to, they could do that sure. as well. Yeah, they can do it as well. For instance, they can have like use for marketing. For instance, they can keep people see uh, can see for instance what kind of uh, aftershave people are using. So they by the components, by the fingerprints and the, co the chemical components of one aftershave, they can improve the different uh, marketing strategy. Okay, so everyone can use this. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm going to think of more questions about that too then. Okay. <laughs> Edward Jones Imhotep is an associate professor in the Department of Science and Technology Studies at York University. He received his PhD in the history of science from Harvard University. He's published on topics ranging from science and national identity in Canada to Glenn Gould and the philosophy of technology. His current research explores the cultural history of our trust in machines. And he is asking, should we trust the machines? Thank you very much uh, for that introduction. Um, so should we trust the machines? So answering that question, it turns out, is actually very complex because it involves asking a series of subsequent questions. Who do we mean by the we in that sentence? What do we mean by trust? Which machines are we actually talking about? So rather than delve into those questions, which would take us actually all night probably to answer, I want instead to focus on the question itself. Because I think that there's something about the asking of that question that says something very interesting about our history with machines, but also about our present and our future with them as well. So the first thing that strikes me about that question is that it has a history, but that that history isn't timeless. So if you were to go back in time, for instance, and ask Leonardo da Vinci if he trusted the machines that he invented, so weapons, <clears throat> flying machines, uh, siege engines, he would probably meet you with a blank stare. Um, so possibly that's because you don't speak 15th century Tuscan Italian. Um, you're, you're not alone, you're not alone. Um, but even if he spoke English, there would be involved a kind of grammatical error because trust was something that applied to people, not something that applied to machines. Machines could be fearsome, they could be terrible, they could be ingenious, but they couldn't be trustworthy. And something happens over the course of the 19th century that changes all of this. Um, and it's linked, it seems, to, to three developments. So the first is that machines start to become autonomous. That is, that they become self-acting, self-regulating. They develop their own internal power sources, heat and electricity. That is, in important ways, at least outwardly, they, they start to mimic organic life forms. 
So by the 1860s, for instance, you already have people speculating. This is just a few years after Darwin publishes The Origin of Species. You have people already speculating that machines will evolve in such a way that they will go from relatively simple mechanisms past steam engines and complex factory machines to create a new race that will actually replace humans on the Earth. The second development that seems to, to be important in this case is a very deep analogy that gets made between the way that machines work and the way that humans work. And this is made possible by thermodynamics, by the science of heat and energy. And uh, what people interpret thermodynamics to say during the course of the 19th century is that machines and people alike, machi both machines and humans, are objects that transform energy into work that they re require the same kinds of power and that they deplete themselves actually in parallel ways. The third important development is that machines start to be seen as the agents of history. They start to be seen as the things that make historical change happen. So we, at the beginning of the 21st century, are the inheritors of that idea about, about technology. When we talk about machines, for instance, as the engines of history, when we talk about technology determining historical outcomes, when we talk about machines evolving to replace us, we're talking in ways that would have been actually very, very similar to people working and thinking about machines in the 19th century. So of course, our anxieties, the machines that we're anxious about, are very different from the machines they were anxious about. They were anxious about things like steam engines and, and telegraphs, and the, the objects that concern us most are computers and computer-related technologies. And our anxieties about them tend to pool in, in three basic areas. So the first is when we ask ourselves, should we trust machines, one of the things that we're asking is, should we trust them to work, period? Should we trust them not to fail? So it turns out that from the uh, middle of the 20th century, so from about the time of the Second World War, we've developed very, very sophisticated ways to try to ensure the reliability of our machines. But there's something, there's a hidden truth in that history that I want to end up underlining for you. And that's captured actually in this illustration that you see here. Um, you can probably see this is actually drawn in the middle of the 1940s. And you can see that the human operator at the center is actually drawn so that his torso is transparent so that you can actually see the mechanisms that he's operating through his body, so that the, the, the controls of the machine seem to, to represent the internal organs of the human. And what I want that to symbolize for you is that very, very often, if we look at the history of our relationship to machines, the history of making machines more trustworthy is intertwined with the history of making people more reliable. It's about an integration of humans and machines to get machines to work the way that they're supposed to work. A second anxiety that we have, though, is about whether machines will work the way that we would under similar circumstances, whether they'll make errors, for instance, that we might not make. So when we're asking ourselves about whether self-driving cars might take us from point A to point B, largely avoiding a collision, or when we ask ourselves whether it is that autonomous battlefield drones using facial recognition technology can target human beings, whether they should make decisions about life and death, about innocence and guilt, we're really uh, raising anxieties that in many ways are about what happens to the complexity and the contingency of the world when it gets filtered through algorithms and through sensors and through computer software. Of course, the drones might turn out to actually be very much like us. Uh, for those of you who can't actually see the cartoon, it's a New Yorker cartoon, and it, says, it has one uh, military official talking to another saying, unfortunately, a tiny percentage of the drones are opposed to violence. But, but even, that, even that illustration suggests a third anxiety, the last anxiety that I want to talk about, which is about what will happen to the evolution, the potential evolution of machines. And that anxiety is really about whether or not we should trust machines to remain servile to remain to do our bidding rather than evolving into something else. Will they go, for instance, from the relatively clunky uh, machines of Alan Turing uh, decoding the, the Nazi Enigma code during the Second World War to these super intelligences that are in, in many ways too much like us? Will they also be competitive? Will they also be greedy in the end? Um, and that's the anxiety that's really at the heart of recent comments from people like, for instance, Bill Gates or Elon Musk or Stephen Hawking uh, about the rise of really super intelligent and self-replicating machines. When Stephen Hawking asks or suggests that super intelligent, self-replicating machines would be able to evolve at a rate that's much faster than our own slow biological evolution and therefore wipe out human beings, he's raising really this anxiety that is almost two centuries old about the capacity of machines to evolve and replace us. So how should we interpret then that historical parallel? How should we interpret the parallel between what happens, the anxieties in the 19th century, and the anxieties that we end up facing today? And it seems to me that there are two very easy interpretations. One would be to say that 
these are the end times. That is, that uh, the, the fears of the 19th century are culminating today and being realized. But the other interpretation, the one certainly that I end up favoring, instead ends up seeing that we are living through times like the ones that our 19th century forebears did as well. That we're learning to work with these revolutionary technologies to figure out what their capacities and their limitations are and what the lines are between us and them. And if that's the case, then the question, should we trust machines, points us to the other great, deep, big questions of our age. Are we alone? Are we unique? And if we're not, what does that mean for our future? Thank you. We can't turn, we can't turn back the clock, can we? Like, we are moving forward at a very rapid pace with machines that can do deep learning. That, um, that will work the way our brains work. Um, so are you worried? You asked that question. Are you worried or are you excited? Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit of both. Um, but the, the point, I guess, is that I think that now is the time to ask that question. If we want to be sure that machines do what we want them to do, rather than by accident kind of having them perform our histories for us, that those are the questions that we have to actually ask now. And I think that we can be both hopeful and wary, and that those two things aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Thank Thanks. And it all comes down to math. <laughs> Jane Heffernan is an associate professor in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics at York University. She also heads the Center for Disease Modeling. She's involved in research initiatives with China, Brazil, and Africa. Her work examines how individual behavior and immunity profiles affect disease outcomes both inside the human body, in host, and at the population level. She earned her PhD at Western University in London, Ontario, and she is asking, how do we prevent a zombie plague? Jane Heffernan, welcome. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, so as uh, was mentioned previously, I'm the director for the Center for Disease Modeling at York University, which is composed of um, mathematicians and public health officials across Canada and globally. And what, what do we do in the centers? We use mathematics and statistics or mathematical models and computer simulations to describe how diseases are spread in a population, how they persist in a population, but we can also use these models to describe how your immune system can interact with the pathogen in the body. And then we can look at vaccines and drug therapies. We can also look at the spread of information in a network, uh, for example, on uh, whether, whether you should get a vaccine or not. So what my partner and I decided to do was to use these tools that we use in disease modeling to look at the question of how to prevent a zombie plague. Okay. So I'm going to take you through the steps that, that we use in dis disease modeling, which goes from take, doing a literature review to gathering data. How do we use that data? Um, and how do we use surveillance information and control uh, ideas for controlling an infection to develop a mathematical model to look at results and to figure out how can we change those results to, to have a more favorable outcome for the human race. So what do we know about zombies? Well, the word zombie actually um, first was introduced into the human language in the Oxford English Dictionary in 1810 um, in a, referring to a book on the history of Brazil and it's talking about individuals that are lacking, individuals that are lacking in self-awareness, intelligence, and soul. And it talks about zombies that were ex imported to South America and the Caribbean from Africa. And this has to do with a religion where zombie is a god. Well, what do we know about zombies today? Well, we do know that zombies are mainly confined to the Caribbean and mainly Haiti. And that's because that's where the voodoo witches live that make zombies. We also know that zombies are limited in number, and that mainly has to do with the limitation or the limited uh, abilities of these voodoo witches to make zombies. What else do we know? Well, if you looked onto the right of that slide there, you'll see that that's a map of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 
And that's a map of all the little black dots that may be a little bit hard to see. That's a map of all the living dead outbreaks and attacks since 1875. So they've been recorded since 1875. Uh, on the left, you'll see a more modern timeline of the existence of zombies in the population as documented by Hollywood. And this lists films from 1968 to 2009. And we have, we have seen more documents um, in, uh, in the future or uh, until, until the current day. But this in, these films and this map are something that we would use then to get information on the spread of zombies so that we can parameterize our mathematical models. Well, what else, do we, what else would we want to do? We would like to look at surveillance data as to where epidemics or outbreaks of infectious disease are in the world. And something that we can use are Google, uh, Google searches. So we can go onto Google and we can look up how many times do people search the word zombie or you can think of our influenza, and that can give us an idea of where that disease is in the world in the current day, but also where there's really good internet connections. <laughs> so this is a map of the Google search on zombie very recently, and you can see that there are quite a few outbreaks or searches in Canada. So this led my partner and I to decide to develop the Center for the Research in the Undead, where we're studying zombies, vampires, and werewolves for fun. And the acronym is CRED. What else do we know about zombies? Well, from our historical documents in ho from Hollywood and from books, we know that there are ways that we can control them. So you can think of effective weapons. Well, some of these are firearms, but we know that we have limit limitations on firearms and the number of bullets especially in Canada. We, from Shaun of the Dead, know that cricket bats are a very effective uh, means for getting rid of zombies, but that's also very limited in Canada because cricket just didn't seem to take off here. <laughs> what else do we know? Well, in 28 days later, we did, we did find that individuals can survive zombieism and actually recover because they have some resistant mutation. And then 28 weeks later, that mutation was used to develop a pharmaceutical to give to individuals so that when they got the, the disease, they could have a 10% probability of recovering from it. Okay, so we can take all of this information and we can incorporate this into the disease model. We also need to understand the evolution of the zombie over time. So, in the beginning, zombies were known for being reanimated from the dead. In 1964, that is the first instance of documentation of zombies needing to eat flesh to survive. In 1968, we have the first uh, instance of the transmission of zombieism through this, through this flesh eating, um, and that is from the Night of the Living Dead. We also know that throughout the Hollywood history, we've seen that zombies have evolved in intelligence, in speed, and strength. And so in Resident Evil, one zombie in Resident Evil could infect 500,000 individuals in one day. So we can take all of that information and incorporate that into a mathematical model where we have susceptible individuals, infected individuals, which is Z for zombie, the dead, because zombies can die and humans can die, and that's how we get the reanimation of the dead to the zombie class. But we also have that recovered class, which is small, but kind of important, because we do want to survive an, a zombie apocalypse. We can incorporate all of this information from, we can get all of the information uh, from those Hollywood films and from all the other documentation in history to give us values for all of our parameters that describe the rates of how individuals move from susceptible to infected to dead or recovery and back. Okay, so what are we going to do? We're gonna look now at how we can track people over time. Well, when we run this model, with parameters that we've gotten from all these films, we actually find that the human race can become extinct and zombies can take over the entire human race in 30 days. <laughs> well, what, what can we do to stop that? 
what do we want our outcome to be? Well, you could think that our outcome would be that we want to make the zombies extinct. Okay? Or maybe we want coexistence. So some, what, what are things that we can think about? Well, we can think about isolation strategies where we can put individuals, zombies or humans, into shopping malls or pubs, which we've seen in Shaun of the Dead, or into warehouses like we've seen in Resident Evil and all the Of the Dead movies. We can make new pharmaceuticals. Perhaps that'd be something that'd be good, but we need one that's way more effective than the one that we saw in 28 Weeks Later. We could use records to hit individuals, just like in Shaun of the Dead as well, when they ran out of cricket bats. <laughs> and really, what do we want our outcome to be? Well, we, can, we maybe want extinction of the zombies, or maybe we want coexistence, because after all, those individuals, they were humans too, and maybe we have some emotion connected to them. Well, using our mathematical models and sensitivity analysis, we can figure out what parameters do we m most need to modify in order for the desired outcome to exist or to happen. And that's something that we use in all of our mathematical models when we're looking at disease modeling. So we can actually, if you look at that diagonal there, that means that if you're on the bottom of the diagonal, a disease outbreak can occur, and if you're above it, you will have no epidemic. And we can calculate this using all of our disease modeling parameters. What's most important to take home from this graph is that the zombies are way over in that bottom left-hand corner. So that means if we have a disease that has parameters very similar to zombies, that is what can take over the human race very quickly. But most of our infectious diseases actually lie just slightly to the left of that diagonal. And so you can see here I've plotted Spanish flu and the bubonic plague. And if you want to think about measles and influenza, rubella, pertussis, mumps, a bunch of other infectious diseases, even HIV, it's much closer to that diagonal. And so you don't actually see all of these infectious diseases killing off the human race. So we can use all these very similar tools the same exact process that I just went through to look at measles and why does measles come back every few years into the population? Can we look at the waning of immunity? Why, do we, why can we get chickenpox more than once? Some individuals can. We can look at pertussis, mumps. We can look at chronic infections like HIV. And if you want to look at a chronic infection like HIV, you can use a very similar, similar model to vampires because they coexist in the population in movies. We can also look at genital herpes with periodic outbreaks, and you could think that that coincides with werewolves. <laughs> you can look at new drugs. How effective does a new drug have to be to help the population? A new vaccine. We know that right now uh, new pertussis vaccines are in development. How, how do we need to incorporate that into the population? We can also look at the spread of information, and that's most important when we're looking at the spread of vaccine hesitancy and why people don't want to get a vaccine. And we can look at all of this in the immune system in a person, between people, in populations, and in populations of populations, especially since we have air travel. So I'm Jane Heffernan, the, center, the director for the Center for Disease Modeling, where I head the group Modeling Infection and Immunity at York University. My collaborator on this zombie project was Derek Wilson, um, who's a biochemist at York. And you can find this paper that I just described to you, including a model on vampires, in this book called The Mathematical Modeling of Zombies, which is edited by my collaborator at the University of Ottawa. Thanks. So here's my question. Could we use biometrics to identify the zombies, which are an invasive species? send an autonomous machine to deal with them and send them to another universe. <laughs> That's why I wanted to go last. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. Uh, anything can apply, and there's, a, there's actually a partner book to this mathematical modeling of zombies. It's called Brains, From Academics to Zombies. And it actually describes studies in law, politics, and crime, and lots of other things in the social sciences to have to do with zombies. And it's edited by the same guy, Robert Smith. Thank you. Thank you, Jane.
I have some questions to ask our guests and then uh, just about maybe 10 minutes worth and then we're going to open it up to you and there is a microphone there in the middle of the room if you have questions that you're already thinking about, um, you can ask that. Oh, just another um, degree of separation. If you are a longtime listener to The Current, do you remember The Voice? How many people remember The Voice? Well, The Voice is an actor named Stephen Hart, who is no longer on our program, but Stephen Hart played the lead zombie in Resident Evil 2. <laughs> so there you go, okay. Um, I'm really <coughs> struck that all of you are talking about um, information, data, the ability to have information much more rapidly, data you can share, the project with 350 lakes around the world, um, uh, the data that is in abundance, Matthew, in the multi, uh, in your work on the multiverse. Um, uh, Edward, you pointed to autonomous machines and uh, the ability that for them to move faster. And I, I guess what I want to ask is, um, we are in a, in a moment in time where it seems to me that all of this is coming together at a speed that really has never been experienced before. And I'm wondering what you think about that in relation to your own work and what that means for us as a society, what we need to think about as we move forward. Um, Edward, I'm going to get you to start. Sure, um, I'm happy to. So uh, I think that you're, that you're absolutely right in the observation that um, all these things are coming together at a speed that is kind of unprecedented. Um, the, the way that I like to think about it, though, is that there, there are kind of lingering historical constant anxieties that we have um, about machines and about the developments that we have in machines. And those, those constants are at least 150 years old. Um, and so rather than dismiss them, there's a tendency, because I think things happen so quickly now and technologies develop so quickly, to think that we are only capable now of thinking through our own problems. And rather than that, I think that history, as, as Leonard, in fact, said uh, when he was talking, gave his talk about, um, about Darwin, that history is really a resource for us, that it's a resource for us to realize that these are also long-standing questions that we've had, and from that resource, we can actually gain some kind of strength to give ourselves perspective and to realize that we, too, are living through what we feel are unprecedented times, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're the end times. And as we live through these times, Sapna Sharma, you are looking at climate change and you have put hard numbers on the results of unchecked um, climate change, uh, that, that unfought climate change if we don't have emissions reductions. I'm wondering, we, we've got all these wonderful new, um, new discoveries on the horizon, but are we going to basically shoot ourselves in the foot if we don't deal with the other side of this? I hope not, um, <laughs> and I don't think so. So that's why in our work we incorporate all the different scenarios of climate change to talk about what are the consequences if we don't mitigate greenhouse gas emissions and continue to emit at current rates versus if we start stabilizing. And so that makes me hopeful that knowing that we won't have as bad consequences as we could um, and having that information 20 years, 30 years in advance could help us prepare for the fact that uh, we could do something about this. At, you know, so much of the conversation now around climate change is, all, is also adaptation. It's not just uh, mitigation. And um, I'm wondering about the kind of work that all of you are doing about helping us to adapt with the science that you're using and helping us to adapt and move forward. Um, Matthew, do you want to talk wow, about that's that? that's a hard one. Um, <laughs> you could always so escape to We could universe. always go to another <laughs> bubble. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> uh, well, I think that as the ideas get bigger, um, it, it, it becomes a challenge to, to incorporate that into our conception of, of, of the world. And, uh, you know, the, the idea that might, there might be other universes or, or thinking about exactly how big the cosmos is uh, is really pretty mind-blowing. I, I, I don't know that we as human beings really have the ability to incorporate that, uh, that level of knowledge or that, that, that size of, of pictures, you know, I mean, um, maybe there's another story on the timeline that comes next where 
We learned to see through sensors. <laughs> uh, and now we need to learn to see things that are not seeable. <laughs> I don't know. I don't but know. we did, and we did that 100 years ago, really. I mean, with the atom. And we, there were plenty of people who opposed the idea of the atom, including Max Planck, right? He, he started his, I don't remember if I said that, but he started his research that led to the quantum theory looking for evidence to depose the idea of the atom. He, he was against the atom. And, and a lot of people were in the 19th century because you can't see them. And some people, as you know, use the atom to explain certain properties of gases. And not, not, you know, not huge triumphs, so it seemed like it might be a little bit useful. But a lot of people thought, that's BS. We shouldn't work. We shouldn't consider in physics uh, objects that we can't see. And obviously, we've gone a long way since then. And, Someday we'll be all like into other universes too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think so. I think we'll grow. We'll, we'll, um, and certainly you can imagine things mathematically in your mind in different dimensions and different curvatures that uh, people who aren't used to doing that you know, can't have a harder time with. But when you work on it, you, you, you get to be able to do that. I'm wondering how many of you, when you began your, your earliest studies, even knew that you could do the work you're doing today. If we talk about the rapid changes, um, I'm guessing you've lived some of them, even in your choice of study. Jane. Yeah, so I didn't know that math could be applied to diseases or to biology really until my fourth year of my undergrad, um, when I took a course in mathematical modeling. And so when I took that course, it was a big eye-opener. And that's when I decided I was going to change career paths and, uh, and go more towards the academic side, where I really wanted to do research in health, but using mathematics, because I really love math. Um, and, and that's why I'm trying now to go out to some high schools, so that they understand that math is useful for something other than um, be, being able to do some and how to teach it. Yes, please applaud her for that. Um, uh, Damien, I'm, I'm wondering about you as well. Uh, when you began, you, you, when, you, when you first started as a, as a student, did you even know you could study the, the level of, no. did it even exist? <laughs> Not really. I didn't know, but I wanted. So when I was an undergrad, I really liked to apply all the basic concepts that you learn in the different uh, fields. So and now, uh, I think all the access that we have to computers, information, everything, and we can apply to different uh, areas. So I believe that a lot of what we do now, it's working an interface. So we can apply pharmacology to forensics and apply mathematics to different fields. So all this interface between the, the, the different fields are very exciting. And I wanted to work in this mm -hmm. kind of interface areas. It's really interesting. And Leonard, I wonder if you can um, just speak to this, the idea that um, uh, at the pace we're advancing, it, it's been called the second machine age, the second industrial revolution, and that it will change it's changing everything. It's changing how we think, what we can study, what's available. It will kill jobs. It will create new ones. Where do you see this going? What, what are your thoughts? Well, there's two issues. One is the acceleration of knowledge, which I, I think is, is happening. And uh, first of all, there's more and more people on the planet. And a, a certain percentage of them are, are engaged in science. We're learning things faster. But also, science is based on what we learned in the past. So it's the amount of science we do at any given time is proportional to what was there when we started. So you get exponential growth. But then the, the machines is a whole other question. And that is a, also a very complex question. For one thing, the machines are, as, as all of you guys, I think, do, you, you use machines heavily in your work, right? And uh, when I started physics, I, we did some computer work, but we all certainly took pride in, in doing everything analytically, that is, using mathematical equations. And uh, the students these days, uh, they just throw it on the computer and they do all their, they do their calculations on the computer and they have machines that will do the algebra for you and it, it's, not just, uh, it's not just numerical analysis. And so machines have also accelerated the pace of scientific development and knowledge. And the other part of the question, though, is you know, the, the machines are also accelerating the development of more machines. And they're not, they're not building themselves, but the knowledge we're gaining through the machines right, mm -hmm. is, is allowing us to build faster machines. We are the instruments of the machines to build better machines. And where it's going, I don't know. Will they take over? Um, you, you tell us. <laughs> I, I hope not. <laughs> but um, 
it's an interesting time, and I, I'm one of those who believes that, that you can't predict the future. So I, I, I really hesitate to say where it's going. I, I, I dwell on where we are now and how we got here. But it is, um, it's quite, uh, when, if we stop and really look around and really acknowledge the, the kind of work that everyone's doing here um, and the ability to move forward at a pace that perhaps they couldn't have when they began the, their first studies, it, it tells us something about how wonderful. Just one really silly, banal example, okay? I was just talking to a friend about this. When I was a graduate student, if you wanted to find out, you want, you're interested in a certain problem and you want to find out what's known about that problem, right? What did you do? You went to the library, you looked and see, there were, there were maybe 10 relevant journals. They went, you look in each, year by year, you'd look in the back of the index and you'd try and look up relevant articles on paper and it would take you maybe an hour for one, one year's worth. And you'd find it, you'd, take, you'd find the article, you'd go Xerox it, it would take months to do this, right? Now with Google, you do it in about five minutes, you get it all there, you print it out or you read it on, you know, and just that, just knowing what's been known, finding out what other people know, it, it, it has gotten so like magically faster. It's, if you're in the field and you're my age, it's just mind boggling. <laughs> well, I have some, I, and I have some, just some specific questions um, about some of the work that's been described here tonight. Um, Jane, if we look at epidemics and your ability to track them through mathematical modeling, what does that mean for our public health policy um, on a world level, given that we, we are we living in a world now with all sorts of travel. I'm thinking of like, we saw the Ebola outbreak. Um, wh what other areas would you look at? What, what does it mean for our ability to stop something, treat something? That's a good question. So one thing that we, we can do through our mathematical models is we can add some probability kind of outlooks as to looking at the probabilities that individuals can interact with each other and looking at the probabilities that a disease will actually be transmitted in those interactions. And so when we look at this, this type of probability distribution, then we can get an idea of when might the peak of an epidemic happen in one country, but we can also get an idea of the range of where that peak might occur and how big that peak might be with a range and when the end of the epidemic could be and how fast it's going to grow in the very beginning. And that really helps us give information to public health on when are you going to really need to mobilize your resources by? How many hospital beds are we going to need in the hospital so that we can account for this variation at the peak? Uh, how much money are we going to need over the entire epidemic? And then we can look at what's the probability that someone who's infectious doesn't show symptoms, then what's the probability that they can get onto an airplane and travel somewhere else and actually transmit to individuals that way? And that's why um, the, the disease modelers are act actually collaborating globally so that we can actually um, help inform all of the public health agencies uh, in terms of uh, large outbreaks of diseases and ones that are highly transmissible. Is there a disease in particular that, um, that, that is of greatest concern? Uh, well, right now my research is mainly focusing on ones that are affecting Toronto. Uh, so measles is, is one of the big ones. Uh, we're also looking at the spread of um, hepatitis, tuberculosis, um, pertussis, and we're also interested in diseases that are spread uh, within NHL teams so that Sidney Crosby doesn't get sick again. <laughs> a little practical side. I want to ask about biometrics and privacy. Um, how much information do we give away without realizing we're giving it? Without realizing, you mentioned the marketers with the aftershave, but it, like, what's the potential for the information we think we're just, it's convenient? Well, um, I think for forensics, there's a huge potential. So if you screen the fingerprints for drugs and explosives in the airport, that will be very, very uh, important. Mm -hmm. But then another uh, part that can also apply for different areas, for instance, we can use the fingerprints and look for this information at hospitals. So we can look for biomarkers and see your, your health state just analyzing the sweat, you know, the fingerprints. So for different areas, I think there is a lot of uh, applications. Yeah. But for the, in terms of society, in terms of how to give permission for a company or someone to check my fingerprint, there's something that we should talk about. There's still some issues on it. So in the airport, the one officer has to ask you, can I look for explosives and, and uh, drugs in your, your fingerprints? And you have to say, 
yes or no, and explain why not. <laughs> <laughs> How much is that going to play a role, even if the government with the government's new anti-terror bill, uh, biometrics? Do you know? Well, I I don't have any idea about the time. I think it's uh, we still uh, evolving the technology. It's getting faster and more possible. But when we're going to have this click that to say, wow, well, now it's time. Let's implement it. That I don't know. It can be any time. I guess that's a question we can ask, huh? Yes. And um, Matthew, I want to ask about the, a little more about the multiverse. I'm wondering, uh, again, if you look at that, you, you make the point of the abundance of data now. Um, if you can project into the future, what will the students who you have now be studying 20 years from now when it comes to the multiverse? Then he'd publish it now. <laughs> <laughs> we won't tell anyone. We'll keep it in the room. <laughs> I have absolutely no idea. But, but let me tell you one thing. Um, there's a sort of depressing slash exciting fact about the universe, which is the fact that there's only one that we can see. Uh, the slightly depressing part about that is that we've in fact collected basically all of the information that's accessible in cosmology. Or we will, you know, within definitely within the next 25, 30 years. It's done. Um, there's a lot of information. So there could be a needle in the haystack. There could be something in there. Um, but I think my students 20 or 30 years from now will either find evidence that the multiverse exists or determine that that's not really an answerable question because we see just one universe. Um, and I think they will be doing something completely different that has nothing to do with anything that I taught them because, as, <laughs> as Leonard said, all of my ideas are wrong. <laughs> I know that that's true. <laughs> so they're going to work on something else. <laughs> um, we, we, I, we've got people uh, waiting for questions, so uh, maybe we can begin. We'll ask you to keep, your, uh, keep it to a question. Um, keep it brief, but go ahead. Uh, Leonard, um, I just finished reading um, uh, Gazinga's book. He's, uh, Which one? It was um, Sperry's uh, assistant in the lab. Uh, uh, back in the 60s. Which book? Pardon? He's written several books. Yeah, I know, but this which, is... Which book? This one right here. <laughs> what does called? it say? You got binoculars? It's a sir? yellow cover. Okay. It's uh, from both sides of the brain. He, he, he won the uh, Nobel Prize in 82 for uh, saying that there were two, two sides <coughs> of two hemispheres of the brain. Anyways, uh, they were back in, at Caltech, and uh, he, he was listening. Uh, Huxley was there with Sperry, and they were both talk, trying to talk uh, Feynman into, uh, 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 like, uh, Huxley wrote the book, uh, Doris of Perception, where he did uh, mescaline. So, um, they were trying to talk Feynman into doing it, and he's going, if I do your drugs, will I still be able to do it, uh, be a physicist? So, like, um... What's the question? Okay. <laughs> when, after he did it, and they both won their, their uh, Nobel Prizes, um, like, how, how did you guys, uh, how did they keep this secret for so long down in Caltech. Uh, Michel Cacou wrote about it uh, in his book. Uh, okay, I gotta get you to, how do they keep the secret so long? Is that the question? We have to stop, we've got yeah, other people. I'll tell you one thing, I was at Caltech when Sperry won the Nobel Prize, I had just gotten there, and it was pretty amazing. It was, uh, I'm going, what am I doing here at this really great place, and uh, you know, I don't, probably not good enough to be here, and I gotta hide somewhere. And, you know, but it's very exciting what people are doing. And I had read about Sperry's work when I was an undergraduate on split brains. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea he was at Caltech. And then one day, like a few weeks after I got there, they're all popping champagne. And guess, Sperry just won the Nobel Prize for the split brain work. And we all, even in the physics department, we had a big party. Mm -hmm. And that, that's what I know <laughs> about uh, Sperry. And, and it was really, really great research, by the way. Everyone said he was a nut. And they, I mean, they knew about the two sides of the brain. But they thought that, that the right side was just not very important, and they didn't think that it, that it would matter if you split the brain. And he did very careful experiments, first on animals uh, before humans. 
uh, to, to be able to discern what, what the two different sides are doing because the speech isn't usually in your left side, but it's in one side or the other. So when you talk to somebody, you're, you're, you're interviewing one side of the brain. And it, it's very subtle how to get information out of the other side of the brain. But it can be done, and you know, he did that, and, 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 and he did that against the, the climate, but that shows you what science is about, right? Because guess what? He did get the Nobel Prize, right? <laughs> because he was right and he did discover something. So that's one of the good things about science that you know, you all trash each other and people have a hard time believing new things and the students 20 years from now know how stupid you were and, <laughs> and Max Planck said something mm -hmm. um, that people, he said something that was very complicated and it was in German but it was eventually uh, <laughs> bastardized into the phrase science advances funeral by funeral which he never said but it sounds great and that's true but it does advance so good for science, right? <laughs> 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 All right, thank you. Okay, we have another question. Go uh, ahead. This is a question for Dr. Johnson. Uh, what are the, uh, some of the possible differences uh, in the rules of physics, uh, and how have the rules changed in alternate universes? <laughs> okay. So I think the short of it is we don't really know. Um, now, one of the reasons that the multiverse is compelling is that if you can change in these different regions the rate at which the universe is expanding, in fact, it's, it's not just expanding at a constant speed, it's expanding faster and faster, it's accelerating, um, you can give a very compelling explanation for why it is accelerating at exactly the rate that we see it accelerating today. So if that's a rule of physics that changes in the multiverse from place to place to place, um, it would be fantastic because it would explain something about nature that doesn't have another explanation. Uh, now, what else could vary? Um, the short of it is we don't really know because it kind of depends on what gives rise to the multiverse. Now, the thing that we think gives rise to the multiverse is a theory called string theory. And uh, in string theory, many things can be different. Uh, the number of dimensions we experience, the particles, the types of particles, all sorts of things. Um, but string theory isn't really a theory. We don't really have a set of equations yet that or a complete description of what, what is string theory. So I can't really tell you right now how diverse it is. Uh, but undoubtedly, if, if, if string theory is the right theory, there's a lot of ifs. If string theory is the right theory, if there is such a thing as the multiverse, it's incredibly diverse with incredibly different laws of physics in very different regions and different places. And people even speculate uh, the, 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 there's, there's some uh, great writings by this guy, Max Tegmark, who talks about different levels of the multiverse. And maybe mathematics, maybe not even a good description of the world in different multiverses. I mean, uh, you can kind of go crazy. Uh, you, you really can, so you need rules. So until I, stand, I sit in this chair and I say, I know what string theory is, I've got a set of equations, and here's what they tell me, uh, I'm wrong. I mean, I'm definitely wrong, so <laughs> we'll see. Go ahead. Follow-on question for Dr. Johnson. I think you may have actually just answered what I was going to ask, but when you gave your description of the creation of the multiverse and the inflation issue right at the point of creation, the first fraction of a second, you're describing something that sounds like mass moving at a speed much greater than the speed of light. Mm. So how does that reconcile with everything we've known up until now? It's true that uh, during this period of inflation, if I look at two points, uh, they are expanding away from each other faster than the speed of light. Totally true. Uh, th that's not a problem with Einstein. <laughs> okay, so uh, Einstein would tell you that I cannot run past you faster than the speed of light, but there's nothing wrong with me running away from you faster than the speed of light. <laughs> it happens to be the way the, the laws of physics work. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Great answer. Go ahead. Uh, another question for Jones, so I guess you're busy tonight. Uh, in your model of the multiverse, the external inflation, it seemed like the bubble universes, it was like they were in relation to each other in 3D, but in space almost. Mm -hmm. Now our universe is space, we were all in it, but how do we know that the multiverse would have a lot, how do we know that the universes could be closer or further away from each other or actually be in relation to each other? I mean, wouldn't it just be a void that they're all equally 
close and infinitely far apart as opposed to like literal bubbles? So I think the analogy, uh, to bring it a little bit back down to Earth, is a little bit more like this. <laughs> um, so we live, in the solar, we, we live in the Earth, right? The Earth is part of the solar system. We know there are other stars with other planets around them. So uh, you can imagine that different solar systems, in a sense, would correspond to different universes. Uh, I mean, in fact, until very recently, we thought uh, that the Milky Way galaxy was all that there was, and there were no other galaxies. And then uh, astronomers learned that those smudges that they saw in their photographic plates were actually farther away than the most distant stars in the Milky Way, so they must be other galaxies. And at that time, they called them other universes. Uh, so it's, it's just uh, taking our view of the universe as we know it now and making it a little bit bigger. Uh, so these bubbles, you can imagine, are just like different galaxies or different solar systems in our galaxy. Uh, they're just separated in space. I mean, there's just, it's, it's, it's no more exotic than that. They're, they're just different places that are really far away. Thank you. We've got two more questions, and then um, Leonard will be signing books at the back. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll have these two questions. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you to everybody. That uh, thank you for a wonderful lecture. And actually, I have two little questions. Uh, one for Leonard, one for Matthew. Uh, one is uh, Leonard mentioned that the signs start with the Greeks, and I was wondering because it's not like I am expert on any of this, but I thought the Greek the Greeks kind of stay with the Egypt for a very long time and took a lot of their knowledge and the many of the Greeks traveled to Egypt to acquire knowledge. Uh, and the Egyptians were pretty, as far as I know, very great scientists. And there has been other cultures that has been great scientists too. So if you can comment on that. And for sure. Matthew, is um, maybe you already answered the question. But I saw this great documentary called Particle Fever. Very, very moving. The, the whole documentary, and towards the end, they were looking basically for one number. If the number was this, is going to be a multiverse. If the number is going to be this other one, is going to be just a universe. And when finally they get the number, it was in the middle, and they didn't have an answer. <laughs> so I believe that was in 2012. So has been solved that answer or, or not? <laughs> So those were my two questions, thank you. Okay, well, Matthew, why don't you start, and then we'll go to Leonard. Uh, no, <laughs> not solved. Uh, th so the, the idea that they were trying to address is how weird does our universe look? Uh, and uh, the, the number that they were talking about was the mass of this Higgs boson particle. And uh, there's an idea called supersymmetry that makes the mass very, quote, natural if it has a certain number. Uh, and it makes it look very unusual if it has a different number. Uh, so all particle theorists are sold, totally sold hook, line, and sinker on this idea of supersymmetry, although not, not so much now because it's in the middle. <laughs> so, so it might, might, might not be such a compelling idea. Uh, Anyway, it goes along with these other things. You know, if, if, uh, if, if speculating about a multiverse actually explains something about our universe, then it's a useful idea. So it's in the middle. I don't know. Uh, it's, it's sort of useful. Supersymmetry might still be useful. It might still be right. But in fact, we'll know uh, with the Large Hadron Collider, which is now powering back up to give us a lot more data, again, referring to this big data, era. Uh, there's more to come on that story. So ask me again in two years. <laughs> okay. and Leonard? Well, my answer is easy. I, I, I don't think I said that science started with the Greeks. Uh, uh, if I did, I certainly didn't mean to say that. So that's an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay, last question. Go ahead. Um, just a quick question for each one of you in each of your fields. We've been talking about big data and the importance of building on knowledge and accelerating knowledge. 
I'm just wondering if there is a conversation in each of your fields about access to that knowledge. Um, so from a sort of political stance, I guess. So when we talk about using the diversity of cultures to look at issues in a different way, yet realizing that access to research knowledge is delimited by cost, price, distribution, and those networks, then we're actually not benefiting from a global contribution to this research if you have to pay to access it. Um, so in that sense, I just wondered if you can comment on the conversation within your field, if it's happening at all, or what the conversation is regarding access to this knowledge that's being created. Who wants to start? Uh, I can speak. Go ahead, um, Jane. So my comment is that a lot of research grants now are requiring open access to the uh, ex uh, experimental data and any data that you've collected that you're basing your research on. So that's, that's one thing, so data is becoming more openly available. Uh, but there is a great limitation uh, in research fields where there, there is a lot of data out there. You can think of public health data, but it's, uh, it's very heavily censored. Um, it's very hard to, to get any of it. Um, and uh, it does require a lot, of, a lot of money and government initiative to make the data available. So it is political for sure. Yeah, just, just maybe to add to that quickly. So um, I absolutely agree uh, with what Jane has said. I'm an historian, and so even the granting councils that I end up drawing on for funds and grants uh, have parallel uh, requirements, for instance, for open data. But uh, you're absolutely right in your question also that one thing is for the data to be in principle available to everybody. But of course, in practice, that isn't true, that you need computers, you need infrastructure, you need internet, you need all of these things that aren't evenly distributed around the world. Um, so that is a huge question, I think, and it is one that people, certainly in my discipline, also end up struggling with, is how is it that you can find forms in which you can end up presenting this data or making it available that don't necessarily require these kinds of very expensive, sometimes very expensive infrastructures in order to do it. I agree with you too. Uh, the only thing that I would add is we also do think is different. We just not only publish papers, but just we also attend to international conference. We try to talk about people, our work. We rotate the places of this conference. So sometimes you're here in Canada, sometimes you go to Brazil for a conference. So we are always talking, our, trying to disseminate our research, our knowledge. In our field, this is a really big issue um, with access to data. And being a scientist in the US and coming back to Canada, I'm seeing a lot of differences politically as well. So in the US, all the data, biological data, are made available. Barack Obama has White House initiatives to make ecological and biological data available online within minutes to within a year of, uh, of being collected. Whereas in Canada, it's a lot harder. Theoretically, it's accessible but actually getting it takes years um, to get. And those images that I showed you of the CMB, you can download all that data and do whatever you want with it with a tool as unsophisticated as Photoshop. Uh, so I'm very lucky that I live in, a, in, a, in both a data-rich field, but also a field where um, essentially everything is made, is made very public. I, I do work that uh, is, uh, Less, relies less on data and more on, on equations. And uh, you know, the physicists have a, uh, a website where you upload your paper, and uh, it used to be you have to wait for things to get published or get preprints. And you know, now, uh, before it even gets published, the, the papers are all uploaded to the, to the website, and, and access to information is easier than, than ever before, and it's been a great blessing, I think. That is all. First thing Stephen Hawking does every day, by the way, in, in, as hard as it is for him to, to uh, read, uh, is he checks that, that, uh, that database for new papers. Every day there's new papers uploaded to it. That's all we have time for. Thank you so much for coming from the dispatches from the Frontiers of Science.